Good morning, and, and thank you, Zawar, and everyone for the opportunity to be here. Um, the one thing that you haven't heard about MFW today is that it, it actually stands for Mervis Finishes Weekly. Um, so I'm not going to spend so much time on it. What I'd like to talk about, and some of it is overlaps, at least in vocabulary, things that have been discussed before. But these are the topics I want to touch on. But most importantly to me is this is the, the one thing I remember from law school, maybe the, on, the only thing I remember from law school. The substantive law is secreted in the interstices of procedure. Mahut and halich, so I was told. When I heard this in law school, I didn't really understand it. After 35 years of litigating, I think I have a, I and I think all of us have a better appreciation of what it means. And, and I, I think of it from the foxhole point of view of the litigator in the courtroom. Uh, the, and, I, and I start with Delaware, and you can transpose this onto your system here. And it really is, I must say, I was here, what was this, over five years ago, six years ago, when there was a debate about whether Israel should have an economic court or a business court. And I remember President Barack of the Israeli Supreme Court was opposed to the idea, taking the position that there should be no specialized courts, not a labor court, not a military court, not a family court, because every issue was really an issue of constitutional reasonableness. Well, I mean, if you're a super genius, I suppose everything does resolve to that level. But for mortals, and particularly for litigators, it's a difficult idea. Um, but in Delaware in particular, the substantive law has been secreted in terms of procedure, I would submit, because of several conditions that exist, not in all cases, but in, in the run, in, in the majority of cases. Obviously, as you've heard, there's a small expert collegial judiciary. Five in the Court of Chancery, five in the Supreme Court, a kind of a dream team minion of corporate governance. Um, the facts, I wrote the facts are not really in dispute. What I mean by that is, it's not like an automobile case where the question is, did the car go through a red light? Was, which color was the light? The basic facts in a corporate case are in the SEC filings or in a very few numbers of documents, the minutes. Um, I mean, the, we all know what happened in a general way. It doesn't mean plaintiffs don't get to take 15 depositions and that we're not required to produce a million documents in a week. That happens too. But a judge looking at a case, I think, is, or, and an ex, particularly an expertized judge, understands fairly quickly what the factual basis is of, of the matter before him or her. Third point, which I think has been critical in, in the development of the substantive law of Delaware, is the practice that there's no live testimony at the preliminary injunction stage. In all the great cases in the 1970s and 80s, with the exception of household, the pill case, were all decided on preliminary injunction motions. Newmont, Revlon, Unical. What that means is the Court of Chancery was presented with a paper record, a record that consisted of documents, the underlying corporate documents, Luckily, God hadn't created emails yet, or those cases would probably still be being argued. We'll come back to email. Depositions, affidavits, which the judges full well knew were written by litigators uh, for the case. It was all paper. There were very long arguments. Uh, an argument today, even in a, in a court of chantry matter, can easily consume an entire day of argument, which is very unusual in the United States. In New York State Supreme Court, which has a commercial part, if you get 20 minutes of argument, that's a long time. In the appellate division of the Supreme Court of the State of New York, nine minutes per side is, is virtually always the maximum amount. I can't clear my throat in nine minutes. Um, no jury, which is an important background fact for the Court of Chancery. Expedition, super fast, super fast. Uh, the typical M&A case in the Court of Chancery, I think, is starts and stops within 30 to 60 days. It, it used to be faster. Uh, the poison pill has slowed down litigation because uh, you can't have any more 20 business day tender offer from start to finish in a hostile case. Or people understand that it does take some time to develop a record 
and for the lawyers to put it together. The discovery in these cases can be quite intense, uh, in particularly, and I'm sure you're seeing this phenomenon here, in stockholder litigation, there, it's asymmetrical. That is, there's very little discovery of the stockholder that can be had. On the other hand, the stockholder under our system can draft a two-page piece of paper demanding documents that can cost the corporate defendant easily a million dollars and sometimes up to ten million dollars to search and produce email. And yes, you can, you can go to the court and ask for relief, but it's very difficult because many times these are not irrelevant documents. And, you know, people are developing techniques to make this more usable, they're developing fancy algorithms, search terms have to be agreed upon. People my age try to stay far away from it because they talk about backup tapes and it's, it's not, not good for us. Um, but it is, it is a fact of litigation life today that did not exist 20 years ago. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing for results is a separate question, but it, it imposes huge expense, huge effort, huge burden, and often involves the court. Another important procedural element, is, as Justice Holland mentioned, is that there's a one-tier appellate review straight to the Supreme Court uh, from either the grant or denial of a preliminary injunction, and that review is typically expedited and can happen extremely quickly in, in the space of one week to three weeks to get a decision. And that's how, that's how the Delaware law grew up. So my proposition is that the Having been secreted in the interstices of these procedures, Delaware law has stayed away from direct reliance on director motives. Because the men and women of the Court of Chancery do not look the directors in the eye, do not hear live testimony in the typical preliminary injunction setting, trials are different, they've developed a series of rules by which they will test fiduciary decisions none of which directly is based upon the motive of the actor. Obviously the business judgment rule, which while it's been used many times in this room, I think if we double click on it, we would find that we mean slightly different things by it. The business judgment rule that I'm familiar with means it's a function of any reasonable, any, any rational purpose. If a court can ascribe any rational purpose to, what, to the corporate act, to the fiduciary act, it will look no further. It will test for only care, and in Delaware that typically means gross negligence. Stop there for a second, at least in a damages case. You and I, in, we're in Delaware driving on the road, hurt somebody, we're liable if we're just negligent. A corporate fiduciary, a director, elected, to care for other people's money has no personal liability under 102b7, assuming and almost virtually every Delaware corporation has that in their charter, unless he or she was grossly negligent. Plain negligence, no liability. Loyalty, loyalty basically means if you're not on both sides of the transaction, if you're not taking something for yourself. An extremely deferential point of view. It allows cases to be dismissed. It takes the courts completely out of testing the substantive correctness or content of corporate decision making. And then one of the greatest advances in Delaware law was when the hostile takeover period came and it ran up against the business judgment rule. And people started to think, and it began in the early 70s, well does it really make sense to apply the business judgment rule when directors are not doing what they typically do, that is deciding whether to build a new plant, deciding what products to invest in, deciding whether to pay dividends. No, they're deciding, they're trying to take action that will impact the ability of someone else to buy the company. Does it make sense to apply as differential standard of that? And so the Delaware created, and by the way, it's very interesting that the word fiduciary does not appear, as far as I know, in the Delaware General Corporation Law. There's no statutory basis for it. It is entirely created by the Delaware courts. So they created the Unical standard, which asks if, if the conduct of the directors touches on issues of corporate control, is the conduct reasonable in relation to the threat posed? And that was explained then later in Unitrin, 
by, in, basically in two parts. Is the conduct preclusive or draconian? And if not, is it within a range of reasonableness? But to go back to the beginning, reasonable in relation to the threat posed. The word reasonable is one of those words that needs context. In Delaware, what reasonable means is, is it something that is objectively reasonable in the eye of the judge? When Unical was decided, I would submit, while it was a great victory for defense, after all, in the Unical case was the most intrusive defense in the history of the world. The board of Unical, fighting off Boone Pickens, declared a discriminatory self-tender. It used corporate funds, unilateral act of the directors, to beat Boone Pickens by buying stock from the stockholders at a premium, all of the stockholders except Boone Pickens, who owned approximately 7%. So it exacted an economic penalty on Pickens as a stockholder for having committed the sin of making an offer that the board deemed to be inadequate and deemed to be coercive. But that defense was upheld. But at the same time, the court announced a test that gave it huge power. It took to itself the right to decide, is defensive conduct reasonable in relation to the threat posed? Now, the, the flip, the, the other bookend of, of Unical was Revlon. What about if you're selling the company, not defending the company? And there, the court announced another test, which is also, I think, gives the court a lot of power, but keeps it away from thinking about why did the directors do what they did? In, in Unical, it's not directly relevant why the directors did what they did. The directors could have been doing what they did out of the purest of motivation. They absolutely and genuinely believed, after careful and complete study, that this bid was wrong. It was a wrong time to sell. It's not enough of a price. But still, whatever they do in response will be judged by the court as to whether or not it's reasonable. When you sell the company, same thing. The court simply looks, did you have a process that was reasonably designed to seek the highest value reasonably available? We all know no one blueprint, many ways to sell a company, uh, but whatever you do, and this, Revlon came up in the context of a crown jewel option, which no one does anymore. Uh, sale to a favored bidder, locked up, in effect, by giving a crown jewel option. Substance and procedure. At the same time Revlon was being litigated in the Delaware courts on a paper record, the exact same case involving SEM was being litigated in New York federal court based on a live hearing. In Revlon, the court issued the injunction at the trial level, enjoying the transaction based on the crown jewel option. In SEM, the trial court declined to grant an injunction. Now, we, we were handling both cases at the same time. We ended up losing SEM in the Supreme Court, so at the end of the day, there were a total of four decisions and we won one of them. It wasn't such a good week. Um, but what was interesting is, that's when I, it really taught me that if you can bring directors into a courtroom and have them look a judge in the eye and tell him or her why they did what they did, it has a tremendous impact. Now, how? It's not doctrinally relevant, maybe, but it has a real impact because there's still a concern, less so now I think than it used to be of so-called structural bias, that directors are all somehow one way or another beholden to management. I mean, Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank has changed that completely. I mean, the biggest change in America which has affected these doctrines are not matters of Delaware law, they're matters of federal law and New York Stock Exchange regulation. The typical board of today of an American public company has one, maybe two members of management and the rest are, quote unquote, defined as independent directors, uh, which basically means the only reason they know each other is because they have nameplates when they sit around the boardroom. And there's a, a lot to debate about whether that's a good system or a bad system compared to the old system, which was if you had a nine-person board, you might have three members of senior management, you might have the retired CEO, you might have the banker for the company, you might have the lawyer for the company, all people who cared about the company and maybe had skin in the game in a way that, quote unquote, truly disinterested directors don't. And I think it's an open question is which will produce greater value in the long term, but again, separate question. 
And then we come to entire fairness, which is two parts, fair price and fair process, reserved for conflict transactions. Uh, and we've had some discussion here today about what the elements of those two things mean, but the most important development was the May decision in MFW, not May, um, May two, th I'm, I'm sorry, uh, May was uh, Chancellor Strine's opinion, the Supreme Court's decision in MFW, which basically tells you that if you have both a, the fully functioning committee and a majority and minority vote, then the arrow, you go back up to business judgment rule. And as we heard today, cases can be dismissed. Now that's a very powerful change. Uh, prior to that, if you had, I mean, I remember talking to boards or talking to special committees. Yes, you should have a special committee. You should empower them to have their own bankers. You should give them the freedom to say no. You should give them, uh, there was a time when we debated, does a special committee in a conflict transaction have to have the power to put in a poison pill against the controlling stockholder? And you have to have a majority minority vote. And then the client said, what's, so clients ask questions. What's this gonna cost? It's gonna cost money, don't worry about it. It's gonna cost a lot of money. Okay, how long is it gonna take? Oh, well, it's very important that things don't get be rushed. It's gonna take time, it's gonna take months. And what's gonna happen? Oh, you're all gonna be deposed afterwards. Oh, well, that's fun. Uh, and all your emails are gonna be produced. And not just your emails from your desktop, emails from your Blackberry, from your iPhone, from your laptop, everything. You're gonna hand over to someone you've never seen before, and they're gonna go through it and decide what the other side gets to see. And they say, okay, what am I gonna get for that? You're gonna get a shift in the burden of proof. Oh, shift in the burden of proof. What does that mean? Well, the, the true answer is, well, yeah, it depends who you ask. Some, some judges think that all it really means is they should hear all the evidence, and after hearing all the evidence, if the evidence is precisely equal, so that they're sitting on the edge of that razor, then they ask, well, who has the burden? And if the burden is with the plaintiffs, then they fall on the defendant's side. Okay. Hard, that was a hard sell. Now you can tell clients in this situation, if you follow the roadmap of MFW, you will be treated the same as a business judgment case. And business judgment cases, A, are not brought that much because they're very hard for plaintiffs to win and stockholder plaintiffs are extremely entrepreneurial, as they should be. But it, it, it's also, it's a very real, very, very real difference. On the other hand, I put the caveat that motive evidence does bleed into the facts, no doubt. I mean, if you pick up a Delaware Court of Chancery opinion, I haven't done a study, but the, uh, the average length is well over 100 pages. Well, it doesn't take 100 pages to decide simple cases. It takes 100 pages because the judges, whatever test they're applying, are very sensitive to what, what the actors are doing and to and to what's really behind what's going on. Because the simple fact is, t take business judgment, if you ask the question, were the directors careful? Well, you know, what the directors did will be obvious. They met for this much time, they did this, they heard these reports, et cetera. Well, if something appears off, like this is a pretty big decision, how come they only talked about it for 10 minutes? Well, then any normal judge is gonna say, well, why, why would a director do that? Why would a director only spend 10 minutes thinking about this. There must be some weird reason. And those are the kind of things that, that pique that kind of inquiry. Uh, but, so even within that framework, things have been happening, I think, that are uh, creating some new realities. One I've mentioned already, I'm sorry to belabor it, but I have the lashes on my back to prove it, email discovery. The second is, uh, the Delaware courts in particular have been expanding disclosure requirements. Uh, Delaware has its own regime in effect of disclosure, separate and apart from the SEC. It does not consider itself limited to the SEC requirements. It has fashioned the notion of a fiduciary duty of disclosure, sometimes called the duty of candor. Uh, it is focused in particular on corporate projections in takeover cases, requiring disclosure projections that 
probably are not dis required to be disclosed under SEC regulations. Uh, they seek information about what the directors actually considered, and they, they're very strong on requiring disclosure of potential conflicts of interest, both by directors and increasingly now by financial advisors. Uh, there has been a, a development, I think, which is, I think we're gonna see more of in the future, which is instead of going in for a preliminary injunction in a deal case, the plaintiff's lawyers are moving facts by discovery, getting discovery, using it to write a better complaint, not moving for a preliminary injunction, but writing a complaint that can survive a motion to dismiss. In an entire fairness case, they can seek discovery, they can use 220 books and records, they can go through the SEC filings, and as the justice indicated, if they can write a complaint that raises sufficient questions that a judge looks at and says, this is something that needs to be further examined, they will survive a motion to dismiss, and then they can go to trial seeking damages. And we've seen several examples, El Paso and others, where uh, the good plaintiff's lawyers have done this to great effect. And, and I think that's gonna be partly the future because the preliminary injunction motion in a deal case, you could reduce all of Delaware takeover law to two sentences. And then uh, I and others like me be totally out of business. The, the basic law is you never get an injunction in a deal case unless there's a higher bid on the table. I don't know of a single case when a court has ever stopped a bid at the request of a stockholder unless there's a higher bid on the table. Number two, you will always get an injunction if there is a higher bid on the table. Now that's a little more cynical, but think of the pressure on the judge who was told there's this infirmity in the process, there's this infirmity in the process, and by the way, judge, if you sign this piece of paper and enjoin this transaction or slow it down long enough that this, this other competing bid can catch up, stockholders will get X hundred million, billion, trillion, or that really long number that the judge had, that much more money. Tremendous pressure. And that's what's created decisions in which I think if there's a higher bid on the table, the, the, the real world impact on a judge to find something flawed in the process is, is really powerful. Um, let me just spend, if I can, a few minutes just noting three new decisions that are expected from our United States Supreme Court probably by the end of this month. Uh, the first is kind of the, almost the poster child for the same theme of substantive law being secreted in tertiaries of procedure. Uh, the Halliburton case raises the question of whether fraud on the market which was established by the Supreme Court's decision in Basic in 1988 as the standard for securities fraud cases. That was a, the fraud on the market theory is what created the possibility of stockholder class actions in the United States because it basically reduced or eliminated the need to prove individual reliance. Under U.S. class action rules, in order to have a class, there must be a predominance of common questions. If proving a stockholder fraud case required proving individual reliance by every stockholder, there couldn't be a class action. That's the best example I know of. Uh, you know, 1966 is when the United States adopted Rule 23, uh, legalized blackmail, whatever you call it, class action practice, but was really in Basic versus Levinson, where the Supreme Court, very upfront, our Supreme Court bent the rule, bent the rule on securities fraud to make it fit the procedural rule of class actions. And that, that will produce the many versions of what it could produce. Then we have the fascinating issue in the United States about the difference between a statute of limitation and a statute of repose. If anybody knows the difference, please speak to me afterwards. I'd like to know. I've never understood it. Uh, and then there's a peculiar question under uh, US securities laws, which has strict liability uh, under section 11 and there the issue, uh, which is also one that only lawyers could like, uh, whether a, fact, a statement to be false has to be objectively and subjectively false. Or can it just be wrong? I don't know. It's, it's, uh, if, if Paul Rowe was here, he could have explained it, I'm sure. Um, just a few words on M&A activity in general. It is increasing, 
uh, this year. I guess that's, that's the good news. 31% um, of the market last year was cross-border transactions, uh, which have their own special problems, as many of you are aware of. And in terms of Delaware, let me also mention, um, I was surprised to learn that, that Israel is the third largest source of incorporations in the state of Delaware, following only the United States and Canada. I thought that was interesting. Um, Spin-offs are, are popular activity. Uh, this is important. The private equity transactions, which generate an awful lot of litigation because a private equity transaction is, it, it almost doesn't fit into any of the boxes necessarily. It can look like a third party transaction or it can look like a going private transaction. And it all depends upon whether the existing management rolls over into the new co, takes equity and gets a lucrative position or whether they walk away. And each one of those is different. Uh, but that's, it's still a strong market and it generates a huge amount of litigation. Uh, just point out here that Delaware amended the statute in 2013 to adopt 251H, uh, which has the effect of allowing uh, the bypass of a stockholder vote on the back end merger, even if the first step tender offer doesn't get you to 90%, which creates the, the short form merger statute. Um, I said I wasn't going to talk so much about MFW, and I'm not, uh, but I think the last bullet, I think, de deserves some attention. The vote standard has given pause in many transactions, depending on how large the control block is. Let's say it's, if it's large, like 60 or 50 percent. Well, then if you want a majority of the, of the minority, you need a majority of the remaining, let's call it 40 percent. Then you run the risk of an activist arbitraging the situation and creating a block. So the calculus used to be, before MFW, the calculus was, well, do I want to have deal risk by requiring a majority minority vote if all I'm going to get for it is a shift in the burden? That's one question. The new question is, do I want deal risk, majority, and I'm putting in majority minority vote, if I have the possibility, and as a planner, I don't know that you can ever say it'll be more than a possibility of getting business judgment rule protection. Because you will never know at the outset how what you were about to start in process is gonna look in hindsight in a courtroom in four months. Yes, we all hope that we're gonna have perfectly functioning committees. We all hope that no one's gonna write stupid emails. We all know everyone does. Uh, we all hope directors are gonna have perfect memories they don't. We all hope that investment bankers are going to be pristine in describing their other interests to the board. It's probably happened. <laughs> but but that, it, it is still a very difficult decision, uh, I think, for, uh, for lawyers to make. Um, the Revlon, Revlon has proved to be a very uh, useful doc doctrinal box, I think, because it's people have understood that most of the process considerations and how to frame the sale process, so long as it's designed to seek the best price or matters of judgment for the board, courts have been uh, very chary of interfering with particular methods chosen. Uh, single bidder strategies are still permissible. Uh, they can be second guessed at times. If you don't have a good reason why you only went to strategic buyers and not to private equity buyers or vice versa, you're gonna have a hard time explaining that in a courtroom. Um, th this is probably the area that I think is, is the wave of the future and it started to be visited in Vice Chancellor Lasser's decision in rural metro. And that is uh, actual and potential conflicts facing financial advisors. And I. I would suggest that's just part of the larger, um, I don't know, milieu is too fancy a word for it, the larger perception in the United States in which financial institutions are currently held in very low regard. Uh, it's all fallout of the financial crisis, of, of TARP, 
representing a financial company, United States, an investment bank or a commercial bank, it's a lot like what representing a tobacco company was 20 years ago. Uh, everything is looked at with a great deal of suspicion and, you know, sometimes correctly so. But always so, whether correctly so or not. And that, I think, is, this is going to be a new, and the plaintiffs, under, plaintiffs lawyers understand this, uh, the discovery of financial advisors is going to be intense. And just, just to take the bare facts of Rural Metro. So Rural Metro is a company that gets sold. Two days after the, de yeah, two days after the decision, the company went bankrupt. The decision held that the company was sold for too little. The company then went bankrupt two days later. The directors in the case, the true fiduciaries, were exculpated. They had no duty of loyalty issue, so they were, the only claims against them were duty of care. They're out of the case. One of the other financial advisors settled out early. The only party left standing was RBC, the investment banker, who was held liable after trial for aiding and abetting a breach of fiduciary duty by the directors. Now, there's still a lot of litigation left in rural metro, but one of the most interesting questions, I think, is, well, what do you do in a situation in which the directors are exculpated? They don't have to put a penny in. You know, it's like the Stephen Wright joke. How come it's a penny for your thoughts, but you've got to put your two cents in? So, somebody's making a penny? Well, that's what's happening in rural metro right now. Because the question before the court is, can RBC be liable for the total difference between what the company was sold for and what the court finds it should have been sold for had the process not been tainted? And what was the taint? The taint was RBC's failure to disclose to the board its conflicts of interest. Or the board's failure to ferret out the conflict of interest of RBC. I think that's a question that uh, is going to require significant thought and the courts are beginning to address. Um, this is, you know, nothing of particular interest there. Um, this is interesting. Hopefully, well, I hope your court continues to get more business built and they will come. Don't, don't let this happen. 97% of all deals over $100 million in the United States draw shell to litigation. What does that mean? No one can ever get it right? What, directors are wrong, do something wrong 97% of the time? Average of seven cases per deal. The figures that are on here are that in close to 50% of the cases, time? One minute. In 50% of the case, I'll, I'll go to turn the button. In 50% of the cases, the litigations are brought in more than one form. Uh, luckily, you're not, you don't have that problem here. It's very good not to have states. Um, uh, this, this is the last thing I want to mention, which is there's an antidote to that problem created uh, uh, by uh, some clever folks. Uh, which is the question of whether directors could adopt a bylaw, acting on their own, unilaterally, that requires all stockholder litigation be brought in a particular court. And that was upheld by the Delaware Supreme Court. Uh, sorry, by the Delaware Court of Chancery. You, you might be hearing some recent buzz about a case called ATP. Uh, don't believe anything you read about it. It's all wrong. Uh, ATP was a very simple case involving the tennis, professional tennis association, a not, a not for pro, a non stock corporation, which had it in a bylaw that said, if one of our members sues us and they're not substantially successful, they have to, the member who caused the, the organization to incur the cost of litigation has to pay the fees. Perfectly sensible rule. Well, some people have jumped on that and said, well, if you can do that in a non-stock corporation, since the power comes under the same Delaware statute applicable to public companies, maybe you could adopt fee shifting in public company bylaws. Uh, I, when I first heard that, I thought that was the most um, creative reading, I suppose, of the Delaware Supreme Court decision. But there actually is the possibility that the Delaware legislature will respond to this uh, with some form of Legislation, it's a tempest in a teapot. It's not going to go anywhere. Even if they pass a statute, it won't have any effect. Nobody really thought, at least I, 
Nobody really thought you could do this anyway. Uh, appraisal rights are an area of, of increasing concern in Delaware and across the country, and there it's, it is a form of mar market arbitrage. Delaware permits, and you see there's many, many large cases being brought now. You can buy stock after announcement, after announcement of the deal, and seek appraisal. And in appraisal, of course, it's totally a question of fair price, it ha fair value. It has nothing to do with board misconduct. It's a, it's a simple uh, financial exercise. A lot of people think it's fueled by the fact that the Delaware interest rate whatever it is, it's far and above the market rate now, and there are people who are doing this in an, on, in an entrepreneurial way uh, to, to extract a form of rent. Um, I can never make a presentation without talking about air gas, I'm sorry. Um, air gas closed yesterday at $109, the highest bid of air products was $70. I wanna mention Sotheby's as my, my last 10 seconds, I know I'm over. Sotheby's was a case that tested for the first time the use of a pill in a new way that is to deal with stockholder activists. The pill that was put in in Sotheby's when Dan Lowe bought close to 7% was to have two tiers, 20% for regular filers, 13G filers, non-activist investment filers, 10% for activists. And he challenged that on a preliminary injunction motion. Uh, it's a very interesting decision by Vice Chancellor Parsons. It did not get to the Supreme Court. Uh, he upheld the use of a pill in that, in that situation. Uh, but it was a very, very um, thoughtful and close decision, and I think we're just beginning the discussion. Uh, Any questions uh, for Ted or for reports on how pills are playable? Uh, discovery proceedings. This was in the MW case where the court found that there was a if I'm wrong, but I believe MFW was decided in the Court of Chancery had to fully... Oh. MFW, I believe, was decided in the Court of Chancery after a fully developed, developed discovery record at the stage of summary judgment. Uh, by fully developed, what that would typically mean is, in a case like that, obviously the controlling stockholders were all deposed. MFW, I believe, was decided in the Court of Chancery after a fully de developed discovery record at the stage of summary judgment. By fully developed, what that would typically mean is, in a case like that, obviously the controlling stockholders were all deposed. Probably between a half and three quarters of the board of the target company were deposed. The financial advisors were deposed. Uh, sometimes I've been, the lawyers get deposed. Uh, who pays for it? The company pays for it. Uh, there's no way to get back any part of it from the plaintiffs. And that's where I talked about the, the asymmetry See, in regular corporate disputes in America, email discovery is workable because two big companies are fighting over the meaning of a contract. Each of them knows that each of them has the power to inflict great pain on the other. In stockholder litigation, the, you know, the stockholder just opens a pocket, you know, it's a handkerchief and a yarmulke, that's it. Uh, Ten costs. I've seen it cost ten million dollars, and there's no way to recover that expense. No. After the decisions, and if this is your people who will die, there will be no discovery. Oh, in the future. I mean, I think, and I don't. Don't you need discovery or find out what the procedure what is? What I mean is the rationale. If you do the two things, then you should be able to move to dismiss. And if you make a motion to dismiss, that's without discovery. But don't you need discovery in order to find out whether the procedure was a valid one? No. You don't get, dis you don't get in effect, yes, discovery to help you write a complaint. You, do, you can use Section 220, which is books and records. Books and records is far, far more limited than discovery in a civil action. And that's why I think the Delaware Supreme Court long ago announced that plaintiffs are entitled to use the inspection of books and records under 220 to help draft a complaint. But if you can't find enough in 220 
plus SEC filings. Don't forget, the SEC filings are not bare bone. I mean, they'll have a background of the transaction section. In, in most conflict transactions, they go through review process at the SEC, so they get expanded upon. I mean, the plaintiff has an awful lot to work with in drafting a complaint. I think, the, the, to me, the, un, uh, the underlying theory of MFW, as written by the Supreme Court, is if you can't find enough between books and records, inspection under 220, and use of all available public material, which includes the SEC filings, to write a complaint that makes a judge think, whoa, something bad happened here, or, or MFW wasn't really followed, or there's something. The plaintiffs will always be able to complain about something, always. There's never gonna be a complaint that just says, this was a transaction, please give me money. Well, <laughs> it ra rarely happens. Um, but no, you cannot get discovery simply for the purpose of beating a motion to dismiss. If you win the motion to dismiss, then you're off to the races. 